All right, hi guys. Welcome back to the Odyssey podcast once again. Thanks for joining us. So hey, basically what we like to do is sit down and have ordinary conversations with extraordinary people whilst extracting knowledge, tips and advice that we could all utilize in our careers and our daily lives. I know it's been a little while, but we're back with a banger episode, I promise you that. All right, and um, let me just say, I don't want to ask you all to do anything all you don't want to do. But if all you like the content and all you like what we're doing, you know, leave us a like, a share, subscribe to the YouTube channel, and the comments. God, I really, I really like the comments on the last video, you know. I really appreciated that. Um, I read through all of them. I really appreciate the... God, I mean, that sounds like it's plenty. It was about nine comments, but... Yeah, that's good enough. <laughs> that's good enough. I really appreciate the feedback. So if you want to leave us some feedback, positive, I would really appreciate it. All right. So I'm really excited for this episode today. We have a, a legend in his field, right? If you don't know him by name, you know, you know his work for sure. We have with us Mr. Nicholas Huggins. He's the founder of Backyard Designs, which is an award-winning creative agency. He's a graphic designer and an illustrator. He's worked with a bunch of different companies from Google, Kesley Band, Bertie's Pepper Sauce, McDonald's, and I could go on for a long, but I'll just say those. All right, he also has a few different collections of NFTs, which is very interesting. We'll get into that. So, Nicholas, thanks so much for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, Real happy to be here. No problem, no problem. So, as usual, we're just going to touch on Nicholas's story and a bit about the industry that he's in. But um, first, and we didn't talk about this yet, but the first thing I have to ask you, Nicholas, what do you think about our logo? <laughs> it's good. I like it a lot. You like it? Yeah. You would change It's anything? better than a lot of, of <laughs> podcast logos out there. So. Do you want to explain it to him now? So, well, obviously, the circle is an O for Odyssey. And then, like, you know, on a road, right, you have the black pitch and then the white center line. So, it would, we can't really use the black on the outside. So, we put the black on the inside. So, what it represents is, like, a, non, uh, like a non-ending circular road, which represents a path. And Odyssey is a never-ending journey or a journey of learning and knowledge. <coughs> and because it's never-ending, it means that, you, you know, you always have to learn, you, you always have to grow. And basically, that's what it represents. Nice. Yeah. Mm. All right, so there you hop straight into it. Nicholas, I want to know what we would need to know about your childhood and your brought up seat to help us understand what helped you reach to the heights that you've reached to today? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, to yeah. be honest with you, like I would say in primary school, I was not really the best student. In secondary school, got a little bit better. I, I still wasn't really like the top of the class, but I was always super interested in art. And I think that that was kind of where my passions lay, right? Mm -hmm. And I am, I am really of the belief that, like not a talent doesn't exist, but everyone is is born with certain passions and loves. And once that is fostered and once, once you continue along those roads, that's how you get better and better and better. So it's not mm -hmm. like that I felt like I had some innate artistic talent in me that has evolved into this. You know, I was just, a, as a child, interested in art. I would enter all the art competitions. I was running along the teachers asking if the art competitions was judged <laughs> as yet because I wanted to know if, if I won or if I came second yeah. or whatever the case is. So... I was I was at a passion for art, um, and then went to CIC for secondary school, and then we had an art teacher, Mr. Rez, and he really kind of once you loved art, he would really kind of take you under his wing and and encourage you in terms of pushing through and trying different techniques and that kind of thing, and in terms of like of, of course apart from the art, I also run the business side of the of the art which is running an agency and I would say that kind of comes from my parents you know especially my dad my dad growing up would always tell me and my sister you know like if you want to make money you have to open a business mm -hmm. whatever that is it doesn't matter just open a business and that is kind of in his mind the way that you could make a good life for yourself so in terms of that that was where that was always kind of ingrained in me so even though I was doing art I still wanted to make money yeah. doing it right because at the end of the day you could do art and you could be the struggling artist or whatever, but like that's a, that's a story as old as time, right? And it's like, I don't want to, I want to do what I love, but I also want to be 
like living a decent enough life where I could enjoy like certain things, right? Yeah. Um, so like I was actually talking to someone earlier to, to, today and I, like I realized like I've been doing some sort of artistic business since like form two or form three because I first started out doing these little cards and I'd basically illustrate on these cards to fit in some, someone's wallet and I'd get my dad to like take it to work and he would laminate it. And basically, I'd sell those cards that have like football crests or whatever, just for like some spending money in school oh, to buy snacks boy. or whatever, right? Yeah. Then CIC started doing real good in Intercol. So I, st- I designed a stencil and I was spray painting it on people's white t shirts that they would wear under their school shirt. Yeah. And before every football match, I'd walk around to every class and say, hey, come to the art room, we can get a spray paint. It was like $10 or whatever the case is. And real people would come. And so. I was like, cool, well, we're making some money here. <laughs> and then at the time, the art, same art teacher, Mr. Rez, he was like, le- look into screen printing, learn how to screen print, right? And so that was when I kind of joined forces with a friend of mine, a guy named Anthony Alkins. And we decided, you know what, cool, we're gonna build some, some up little printing press. And we started printing t-shirts for parties. We'd print like committee on the back of the shirt with the logo on the front. And yeah, yeah, that yeah. was kind of like from form five up until upper six. That was what I was doing pretty much like almost like three afternoons a week and on, on the weekends as well, depending on how much work we had during carnival, it was a lot. Um, and then during the summer as well with fets and stuff, it would be a lot. And then even now, like I still have a t-shirt company called um, De- Deft-, Deft Month, which is still ongoing. We, take a, we took a little bit of a pause on actually working on it just because both me and my business partner, a guy named Kevin Ross, mm-hmm. because we we're so busy, he just had a child and like COVID and everything. So we kind of put a pause on that. But up to now, I still have a t-shirt company and that's always something that I've, I've been interested in, you know? So I've always been involved in the business side of, of art, you know? That's interesting. Yeah. What kind of jerseys you always sell at this point? At this point? We just... Be- before the break. Yeah, we just... Uh, it was just a lifestyle clothing brand. Um, so really just stuff to kind of wear out, little logos, some bigger graphics, that kind of thing. Mm. Yeah. And we kind of wanted it to be super high quality t-shirts. So we sourced t-shirts from um, California, bring them in, and then we would sort, I would do the designs and then we'd print it at Kev- Kevin's mom's house, basically. Okay, yeah, yeah, real yeah. backyard kind of <laughs> thing. That's why I have backyard yeah, design, right? From. Yeah, we always doing it uh, kind of a different way, you know? Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. That's interesting. I wonder why, if that's the reason why like, people don't really, like, you know, there's a kind of stigma attached to like, art and being creative because especially in schools Mm -hmm. everybody cares about like science and because they think those are things are gonna make money so you want you think that the reason for that is because of like the whole struggling artist stereotype yeah i think so i think people probably look at artists and it's like you need to get your big break or you need to do a piece for the right person or whatever the case is so there's there is i guess that stigma granted my career path has led me through down the road of design which is different to art art is Mm -hmm creating something for, you, for yourself. It's just a creative expression. Whereas mm-hmm. design is, is client-based. Your desi- the design has to be used for something, right? So it's a little bit different, but I think that if you are artistically inclined and want to remain in the artistic field and you're not like a super famous painter or something, there are different ways to like make money being creative, you know? Whether that's through animation or whether that's through illustrating kids' books, you know? There's so many different avenues you could go down as a creative, that's not necessarily just, oh, I'm a painter or, oh, I do drawings or what, whatever the case is, you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, what I want to know, I want to go back a little bit, but what point was it that you decided, because it's one thing to like art and say, you know, but it's the next thing to say, I want to do this as my career, especially knowing that stigma and thing at the time. Yeah, I think it, it was in Form 6. I was doing art, geography, and environmental science. So it was kind of like, Cool. It was basically came to a fork in the road. It was like I could go down the road of that geography, environmental science side of it, or art, right? Mm-hmm. And at the time, I had a few friends who were gonna go study environmental science, and it definitely piqued my interest. It was something that I really loved. Um, but at the end of the day, I loved art even more, right? But you still kind of think to yourself, is there something that is feasible to go study, right? Because obviously, okay. university costs a lot of money, right? Yeah. Um, but my art teacher, my dad, I think I spoke and I think my dad was like, cool, I think that's a good, a good idea. And so I went to the Savannah College of Art and Design, mm-hmm. which is like, cool. Once you go to that school, you're pretty much, the tagline for the school is the University for Creative Careers. So they, their whole mission at that school is really to 
prepare you to have a career in the creative industry, whatever that is, right? At the time, I didn't even really know what anything in art was. I thought it was painting, drawing, that kind of thing. And, and it was only when I went to that school that I realized there are like over 100 different fields of study all within the creative industry, right? Like Serious. literally everything from textile design, where you're literally designing like fabrics and textiles, furniture design, industrial design, yeah. fashion, um, accessory design, where you design shoes and handbags. There's like, I mean, literally hun- like over 100 different avenues that you could go down. Yeah. Of course, they had painting, illustration, the kind of typical interior design, architecture, whatever, whatever. So it was only when I got there, I didn't even really know what graphic design was at the time, even though I was doing it, printing t-shirts, and I, because I was creating icons and logos to print on t-shirts, I didn't really consider that to be anything, right? I was just something I did, right? So I got to this school and I was like, okay, cool, let me, I took a few classes, let me, let me kind of play around with the fields and see what I like. And then I took an introduction to graphic design class. And that was really where I was like, wow, this is actually really fun because graphic design has so many rules Mm-hmm. within it right and even now in my creative pro- process i like to put different rules in place for myself right because i think it it allows you to generate maybe better ideas under that sort of yeah. stress of of it being a specific thing right so graphic design has a lot of rules it has to you work with a grid you work with whatever if you're doing a logo it has to it has to be be able to work on black it has to be able to work on white on color like there's so many different things it's not just creating something for the sake of it. So I was actually really drawn to that. Um, and then I just kind of decided, you know what, forget everything else I was planning to do because I wanted to do painting and illustration. Mm. But I was like, I could always paint, I could always illustrate. But I think graphic design with all its rules is something that is maybe time better spent learning in, a, in, an, in like an educational institution right. setup, right. you know? Yes. I was like, I, I could always learn to paint or learn to illustrate or whatever afterwards, you know? Yeah, that's true. And even now that you have a name for yourself, you do a little painting, it might be caught in myself even more. I actually literally spent the entire weekend working on some pa- paintings for an ex- a carnival exhibition coming up. So sure. it's still like painting and illustration are still things that are part of my everyday, or at least every week process, you know? My whole Instagram page are il- illustrations, you know? So I think that... It, I did stick to my original plan, which was to continue practicing, even though I didn't learn it in a, in a university type of thing, you know? Right. And, it, and it sounds like your father is obviously a businessman. And, well, he sent you to school. He's, so not, he, he's actually not a businessman. He's, he's, not? An, he's an insurance, right? Okay. And funnily enough, he would see, he had a range of clients, and he would basically take me, because like, he had a client who was based in Belmont with an animation studio in Belmont, right? Mm-hmm. And he's like, this is a guy who, is, who did art and is in the artistic field and he's making money doing it and he has a team and all this kind of thing. So I think my dad saw different yeah, businesses yeah, right. and kind of used that to like... Justify to, it. Yeah, yeah, to indicate what he thought his kid should, should yeah, get into, right, you know? Right. Yeah. That gave him motivation to back you, basically. Exactly. So your parents are fully on your side. Yeah, yeah, 100. And I'm very fortunate for that because I know a lot of people, if they want to go and study something that maybe their parents don't think is a good idea... Yeah, for sure. yeah for sure. exactly so I was very fortunate that both my parents both, both my mom and dad were very like um, progressive in, in that they supported my decision to do art you know very yeah. lucky yeah boy <laughs> <laughs> so after college now what, what happened then came back home to Trinidad right and I was in a little freelance work um, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. I wasn't sure if I wanted to go down the agency route, go down the freelance route. I wasn't really too sure what I wanted to actually do. So I was like, I'll take the three months after and I will take that kind of time off and then I'd look for a job in September. And I was doing, I was doing a logo design for a guy named Andrew Lewis, who is the Olympic sailor, right? Because right. um, he was coming out with a foundation and he wanted a logo for it. So I was, that was like one of my first freelance jobs out of school. So I was working on that and... Um, his cousin was the marketing director at Restaurant Holdings Limited, and they did Popeyes and Burger King in Trinidad. So they were looking for a graphic designer because they, were, they, had, a, they had an advertising agency, but I think they thought that by hiring a graphic designer in-house, they would kind of save costs and they would be able to get their designs a lot quicker, right? So Andrew said, hey, my cousin is hiring as a, a graphic designer. So I said, cool, I'll just go and hear him out and see what it is. I wasn't too sure if I wanted to do a job or if I wanted to do freelance. 
So I went and spoke to him. And the week after, they offered me the job, right? Mm -hmm. But they wanted me to start like the next week. And I was kind of like, oh, I kind of want to just enjoy this little yeah, three months yeah, time yeah. off, right? <laughs> but I was like, whatever, let me take the opportunity. And yeah, for sure. I was very lucky at the time because my, my boss at Restaurant Holdings Limited basically told me, he's like, we're not going to have eight hours of work for you to do a day. So if you like an in between, you could work on some freelance stuff because he knew I wanted to be doing freelance work, right? So he's like, yeah. So instead of sitting down doing nothing, he's like, you could, while, while you're not working on our stuff, once you get our stuff done in like a timely manner, you could work on freelance work, you could work on whatever. And that's when I was like, cool, this sounds good. I were, so at, that, at the time, that's when I started my Instagram page, right? Yeah. And I started just, I was like, let me just do an illustration every day and see how that goes, right? Because at the time I was following some big illustration pages and just kind of seeing the opportunities that these people had when they built up this following or like they showed consistency over time or whatever. So I said, cool, I'll start that. So I started doing illustrations, posting it every day, just stuff that I liked, you know? Like one of my first ones I did was like the Beastie Boys. One was Jay-Z, one was Justin Timberlake. Like just, if I was listening to a song, I'd be like, cool, let me illustrate this person just for practice, right? Yeah. And I was also doing a little bit of freelance work on his side, but also just building up kind of my portfolio of illustration work, right? So I was doing that. And I say there's only a limited amount of time you could stay at hamburgers every single day for your life, right? So that time was about nine or 10 months. So I was like, at that time, I was kind of cool. This has been a really good op opportunity. Like I learned a lot. And you learn a lot about like preparing artwork for print because you have to print billboards you, about big print, small print, how to set up all the artwork, how to, because they will also send stuff from like Burger King abroad and you have to get it and basically restructure it for use in Trinidad. Yeah. Or yeah. we would do things where we would have to develop entire campaigns for Trinidad, like let's say like a, po a post carnival Lent campaign about chicken sandwiches, right? Mm -hmm. And I would have to basically write the headlines of the ads. I would have to work with the marketing team to develop all the ideas. So I was getting like a really well-rounded kind of advertising background at the same time, right? Yeah. And then um, like maybe 10 or 11 months into that job, I saw an ad on Facebook, McCann Erickson, which is like one of the biggest advertising agencies in Trinidad, we're hiring. It was like senior art director, five years experience. So I was like, you know what? Why not? The worst they could say is no, right? So I was like, cool, let, let me apply, right? I was like, most likely I'll never even get a call, but I just applied anyway. Got a call to do an interview. Went in after work one day, showed up there, and did like, I think I did like two or three interviews with the creative director and one of the like, um, a, a, like other guys in the creative team. Um, and I got the job and I was like, wow. This is actually crazy, right? Yeah, and that was like jumping into the deep end, right? Like yeah, I didn't right. know how hard advertising was until like I went into it, right? Because it's very different to graphic design. Graphic design, you're creating logos, you're creating um, packaging design, you're doing all this random stuff. Whereas with advertising, you're doing a lot of work in Photoshop to create these ads. You're doing a lot of, um, there's a lot of photography involved. There's a lot, there's just so much involved and the turnover time is so quick. That's why like, I literally tell, every time I go to speak to a class who are doing design, or I speak to a young designer, I'm like, go work in an advertising agency for like at least six months to a year. Because mm -hmm. you will learn so much. Mm -hmm. I think in like my first three months, I was on probation and then you get the thing wherever. And I was like, there's no, like I felt like I was sink or swim and I was sinking. I was like, I <laughs> suck at this job, right? <laughs> um, but I was like, it's advertising. It's not really what I studied, but... I could still kind of do it. And I would literally n try to figure out what I had to do the next day because every day you come to work and you get a brief on your desk, right? Mm -hmm. As to what you have to do that day. I was doing a lot of work for B-Mobile at the time. So a lot of it would be like create an ad, advertising, Huawei phones or whatever, right? And you sit down, you spend the morning creating it. We're doing a lot of work for Bahamas Telecommunications as well, which had like the most wild look and feel with all these ribbons making different shapes. And yeah, I was yeah, like, yeah, yeah. couldn't figure out how to do that at all in Photoshop because I wasn't really my app that I, like that was the program I was really using that much and I was using yeah. Adobe Illustrator but now I had to basically learn Photoshop on the fly right mm -hmm. and I would literally go home every night after work go on YouTube and just look at Photoshop tutorials every single night to try to figure out how the hell to do my job <laughs> the next day right um but I mean it worked out well in the end I was able to work on some really cool campaigns I was I worked on the B-Mobile rebrand um worked on some cool campaigns for Angostura 
um, amongst like many, many others, you know. So I had a really good time there. And I, and I think I was at McCann for two and a half years. And like I still look, look back at my time at McCann like really as like happy times. Um, the work hours were a little bit stressful because also in Ad- I, I came from literally working, doing work for Burger King, Juni Day, and being able to like take a little two hours in the morning to do an illustration and whatever, whatever. And you go to McCann, it's like 8 a.m. to like 6 p.m. every single day. And it's like, wow. And then some days if the deadlines like get an extended, you're there until like 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock at night sometimes. So it was a high stress job. We learned so, so, so much. And that's why I tell young designers, go and work in an advertising agency and you'll be prepared for literally anything in the design world after that, you know? Um, so yeah, I was there for, yeah, like two and a half, two and a half years. And also too, I was still trying to maintain the daily illustration. So I was waking up at like 5, 30, 6 in the morning. Oh, would spend like an hour and a half working, right? That's wickedness. Yeah, and then I'd come home at night and then I'd work on like freelance stuff at night. So you I was still doing any freelance work? While I was still doing any freelance work, yeah. Because I, I knew my long-term play was that I would eventually work for myself. So, so I was like, so building up the I was like, I need to be doing freelance work because if not, I can't just jump out after this job and expect freelance clients, right? I needed to build up a little clientele, you know? So I was still doing freelance work. So yeah, that was probably some of the hardest hours of working in my life. So yeah. When you was managing that freelance work, and McCann, plus after McCann work, you're trying to learn what to do at McCann work the next day too. Yeah, well, that, the learning how to do, that was like the first three or four months. And at that time, the freelance work and stuff did take a little backseat because I was like, I need, to, yeah. I need to nail this first, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I pr- definitely prioritized that over anything else. Was more when I got a little bit more comfortable in terms of like how everything worked, that was when I was like, cool, I feel like I could come home and, and switch across, do some freelance work, that kind of thing, yeah. What caused you to leave McCann then? Um, it was like, when was it, boy? January 2017. I was like, all right, there's a year. I'm going to leave. Um, I got together with my now wife um, at the time. So we were like a fresh relationship. She worked for herself. And so I kind of saw like the possibility of working for yourself, right? Um, like I saw the possibility up close and personal, basically. Yeah. Um, and she was kind of giving me a little advice. Like this is... This is what you need to be doing, da da da, to set yourself up. And at the time, the salary that I was making, I was like, I was starting to ration in my head. Cool, if I do two logos and one Facebook ad, like I was trying to like come up with all the formulas to figure out how to basically match my salary if I yeah, did yeah, quit yeah. my job, right? Um, and I ended up leaving in April. I basically, I had one pretty big packaging job lined up. And then I was also doing social media stuff for a big insurance company at the time. Um, so I kind of knew like between those two, in that first month, I'd make more money than I was making at my job, right? And I was like, that's just two jobs. I was like, I, I was like, I trust myself that in 30 days, I could finish those two jobs. And let's say it takes me two weeks to finish those two jobs. I now have two weeks to figure out the month after. Right. That was kind of how I looked at it. And happily enough like it worked out you know but it was definitely risky but of course like you come from a situation where if you can't pay rent you know i could always move back in at home you know so it's not really like it wasn't necessarily make or break the only thing i'd have probably taken a hit was my ego but at the end of the day like you don't want to feel right you don't want to feel at anything so yeah so luckily i was it was i had like a soft landing if things went south but yeah, everything turned out well in the end, you know. So that was kind of the start of my freelance journey after working at McCann. Right. You know what I want to know, though? How is it working with clients? Because I, I have a friend in graphic design. She now started working for a company. And she told me how she enjoying it. But she hates working for clients because, like, her vision and thing is kind of impeded, if you know what I mean. Because you're working with what they want and you're kind of restricted to that and you have your own creative you know yeah so that is kind of the that's where when you know like leave school and you know starting to work with clients that's kind of the the problem a quote unquote that a lot of designers run into right Mm -hmm. because you're at university you're working on design projects and basically you come up with the brief you come up with the idea you come up with all these things and really and truly 
you just show it to your class who are other designers, right? So they pretty much have a good eye for what is currently trending or what, what looks good, right? So you really just have to produce something good, you know, that looks good, right? Mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. Whereas when you, then you jump into the real world and you're like, okay, we have to produce something that strikes that balance of like, it looks good and I'm happy. I'd be happy to add this to my portfolio, right? But it also has to serve the purpose of what the client has in their mind, right? Mm-hmm. Because at the end of the day, as I kind of touched on earlier, you're not doing art, you're doing design, right? So if you're doing art, cool, you could do whatever you want and get away with it, right? Or design, you have clients, they have their needs. And at the end of the day, like I tell young designers this all the time, you know, like your client probably knows their market better than you do, even as much as you research it and stuff. So you definitely still need to take on board the client's suggestions, right? But it then comes to a point where if you feel like it's not looking good or your creative direction is being impeded, you then need to learn how to talk to clients and basically sell them on what you're doing on your vision, right? And they may come back and say, no, I don't agree because X, Y, Z. So it then becomes a situation where you need to kind of understand how to argue your point and basically strike the authority as a designer that this, I'm the authority in design, you're the authority in whatever it is your, your business is. So you take my advice. But at the end of the day, like, unfortunately, you can't really convince everybody every time. So sometimes you just have to like, bite the bullet and do what the client wants. Um, and then I just suggest if you don't like how it looks, then don't put it in your portfolio. You know, that's kind of the, the get around to that. But I think that's just the, that's the name of the game, right? You're working with, mm-hmm. you're working for clients. So that's at the end of the day, that is them, right? Yeah. You know, and I know like it's very, um, you go on Twitter and design Twitter and design Instagram and people like to kind of fight down clients. But at the end of the day, like you, that's who's hiring you to do work. Exactly. Like just, you have to give them kind of what they want within the realms of what looks good and also what works, right? Because design has to work, you know? So how did you transition from doing freelance work to start in your own business? Good question. So basically, I was doing freelance work out of Macan, and every time I would get hired, the expectation would be that I would do it because I was just operating as a solo freelancer, right? But I kind of, at the time, kind of put my business hat on. I was like, how do I possibly scale this into something that could potentially be more profitable long term and also something where I, Nicholas Huggins, the person, do not have to be sat at my desk all day designing work if more work comes in. Like I could hire a team of designers or whatever the case is. So I was after I think I from like uh, after like a year and a half of freelance and I was like cool, let me hire First of all, I was like, let me hire a client service person. So that was my, the first person that I hired. And her job was basically just to manage clients. So at the time, I was doing all the freelance, all the freelance graphic design work. I was doing also dealing, having to deal with all the clients, put together all the codes, put together all the invoices, do all the account. Like, I was literally like a one-man Easy. business, right? Yeah. So I was like, half my work is talking to clients, getting briefs, doing all this, answering emails. So I hired someone to basically take that load off so that I could then focus on the design. Mm-hmm. Then from there, I was like, cool, I eventually, not, I, know, I now know that I want to hire maybe a couple other graphic designers. So that's when I was like, let me formalize this whole thing into some sort of, not really an agency, but like a, a design studio, right? Mm-hmm. Which is, I don't know necessarily what the difference is, per the dictionary, but I think of an agency as being something really big and a design studio is maybe a little more small and niche, right? Yeah, intimate. Yeah, and I was like, I want to focus on branding, packaging, and illustration, right? So same thing that, like, what I was telling you, like, if you don't like something or you don't want to do it, don't put it in your port- portfolio of work, right? So like, I was doing social media, I was doing um, press ads and flyers and annual reports, but I wasn't adding any of that to my portfolio because I didn't want to push that I was doing that. That was kind of like a by the way stuff to kind of pay the bills as well. Right. So that's when I was like, cool, I'll start this design studio. So I formed Backyard Design in January 2019. At the time, it was myself and a client service person. And then we basically built up the business through 20, throughout 2019. Um, and then basically... We're hiring like freelance designers for certain projects. So like if I was working on a package and design, I might hire someone to do like one option. Cause at that time I was doing three options. So if basically 
how it works right now is if you come to me and you say, yeah, I'm doing cans of water, I would present three logo options, three packaging design options, like label options. So right. it was a lot of work for me by myself, right? So especially if you're working on, like, let's say you're working on three packaging design projects at once, that's now nine designs you pretty much have to do. Mm-hmm. Plus the client normally comes back with changes and edits and stuff. So it was just becoming a lot. So I was like, through 2019, that was kind of fine. But then the business had to pick up a little bit and I went into 2020. Um, and then COVID hit, obviously. Yeah. Um, but COVID was kind of a blessing for the business side of it. Um, mm-hmm. Because I was, so I actually was visiting my in-laws in England, right? And I got trapped out of the country. So I was in England for eight months over COVID from March until October. So I didn't really have anything to do. I didn't have a social life. No one was doing anything. It was COVID, obviously. So like, there's really nothing going on. I was just in England doing nothing, being in lockdown, not talking to anybody, right? Mm -hmm. So I was really really able to sit down and be very hyper-focused on building a business. And then at the time, because so many businesses kind of took a break and basically stopped, a lot of people were like, cool, now is the time that we want to rebrand, right? Mm -hmm. So they were like, let's take this little time off to do rebrands and to, or a lot of people realize that, wow, I'm working from home now, or I got laid off or whatever, and they're now looking to start a business. So I got a, a huge influx of jobs during that initial COVID period that kind of was able then to let me hire. I think I hired two designers in 2020 mm-hmm. based on all that incoming work because of COVID, right? Um, I would say it was really in 20. End of 2021 to end to the start of 2022, that I that I then saw the kind of economic yeah. hit of COVID, and it was really then that things really slowed down, but things kind of picked back up again. I would say like midway through this year, all right? right. Um, obviously, with the with the Google Doodle job, I got a lot of eyes on my project on my business, mm-hmm. so that actually came out in July of 2022, and that from there just kind of have been riding that wave of like new people finding out about my work from there, you know, and doing a lot of murals and public art displays and stuff, you know, and, and I'm lucky that now I'm at a point where people hire me because they want my work, right? So it's, it's a lot of, someone might come to me to do a mural and it's like, cool, you, you do you, you know? We don't really yeah. have huge creative input. So like, to me, that's a dream of, that's yeah, a dream well, job of a creative, right? A sweet spot. It is, and like, even, I think when I first started as a freelancer, like I would always set kind of goals for myself as to how I define success, right? Um, one, of, like, one of my early goals was like, I want to be able to have enough money in the bank or have enough savings that I could just pick up and say I'm going to travel, travel tomorrow, you know? Mm-hmm. And luckily, like my business has afforded me to be able to do a lot of traveling. Um, so like I hit that kind of measure of success. And then it was like, cool, I want to be hired to do stuff because of my work and not just because someone just wants to get something done. Right. And now I'm kind of hitting that spot. So like next up is like, okay, what's the next measure of success as well? You know, and like I've been fortunate enough that I've built out a team. So I've been able to like add economically to several people within, within my team as well. So things have been going really good from like those touch points, you know? So, I mean, it's, yeah, pretty happy with how right. the kind of, transgression of how everything has been, you know? Sure. Yeah. But you know, you can't just bring up the Google Doodle like right that and walk <laughs> yeah. past it, you know? Get into that. Get into <laughs> we had to hear that story. How, the, how that came about? Yeah, so I was actually in England at the time. It was probably, it was probably like l- lockdown had kind of just started. So it must have been like March, March of 2020. And I got a DM on Instagram from some lady and she was like, hey, I'm an art director at Google. I want, we want you to work on a Google Doodle. Is that something you'd be interested in? I was like, yeah, of course. Like, that was one of the holy grails of illustrations to do a Google Doodle. Google so, slide in your oh, DMs. So just explain what a Google That's Doodle crazy. is for the people who don't know. Right, so basically a Google Doodle is on maybe like once every week or a few weeks. They basically, and it is market dependent. So they would basically, when you go on Google.com, instead of it just being a Google logo, they would replace it with some sort of unique artwork that still kind of spells out Google. So you know where you are, but it's highlighting something, right? So the one I got, the one I did was the steel pan. So it was highlighting the steel pan on that day. 
Um, and what was actually really cool about mine, I, th- I kind of thought, cool, they'll do it, and it would be like maybe in Trinidad and maybe the Caribbean, but it was like a full-on global Google Doodle Crazy. with like many, many, many countries. Like I was getting DMs from like everywhere, Dred. So it was real cool. Yeah, but that, that got millions of views on YouTube. Yeah, they took down the view count for some reason. I'm not yeah. sure why, but I think it's because, if I had to guess, I don't know for sure, but YouTube is owned by Google, yeah, and I think that they don't want to like highlight how many views their stuff is. I don't, I don't know. I'm not really 100% sure, but the view count was up for a while, and I think it had come out, I guess, in the morning, and then by, like, 11 o'clock, it had, like, 5 million views. And it was also the number one trending video on YouTube for, like, three days, which was insane. That's globally, crazy. like, literally glo- globally. Um, you ever get yeah. imposter syndrome from that? Must. Yeah, I mean, even, like, after it came, I was like, well, I DM the lady back, I was like, why do you choose me, <laughs> you know? Um... Because, I mean, Trinidad is a place that is, like, inundated with talent, you know? Like, I look at all my peers in Trinidad, I'm like, I could see so many people who would have been such a good fit for that, you know? But, I mean, luckily, I was the one that, luckily for me, I guess, that I was the one that they chose to go with. Yeah, the lady DM'd me on Instagram. So, of course, I had to Google her because I was like, I ain't trusting I would have thought that was a scam, for sure. For sure, for sure, for sure. I was like, this lady is for sure going to ask me to, like, send me some bank information. And all of a sudden, all my money going on. I don't know. So, I was like, cool, let me, let me Google this lady. I went on her profile and I saw that she had a previous Google Doodles that she had worked on that she posted. So, I was like, all right, cool, this is legit. So checked her on LinkedIn. Like, just made sure everything looked right. Um, so, then I went back, DM'd her. I was like... Yeah, <laughs> please. I was like, she's like, cool. She's like, I'll send you an email. So she sent me an email with a non-disclosure agreement. So basically, she's like, you can't talk about this to anybody, right? So that was that was real stress too. I want to talk to you about because that that thing took how long? Two years or something? Yeah, two years. It, she first contacted me in March or April 2020, and it came out July 2022. So and you so had you to keep tell, that from you everybody for two, years. for two years. Yeah, well, except years. the people, the other people who worked on it. Yeah. Very, very, very few people knew. It was like my wife, obviously. Yeah, of course, I was not about to ask. Yeah, <laughs> I told my, and I told my parents. Right? I would eat at my soul, but yeah. I would yeah. I yeah. blame on my friends. I yeah. Would yeah. Yeah. Bill, right? yeah, I don't know. It was, it was pressure. Um, and I was just like, oh my God, this career defining <laughs> moment is like eh, coming anytime soon. And I was like, and every year I got pushed back. I was like, no, another year. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was originally supposed to come out July 26, 2020, right? Mm-hmm. But they originally got me and they were like, cool, we're just going to do the word Google. You basically send us sketches. We'll approve which one we like and then we go through. So we went through that whole process and sent him a bunch, a bunch of different sketches of how it could be done or whatever, whatever. Um, all these sketches actually on my website. So if anyone just Googles nicholashuggins.com and they go on my, my blog, I think it's on a like journal you'll see all these sketches and all that kind of stuff. So that, like, I, I've sh- I share the whole process and you could see all the images and stuff there. But what, um, right, so we're doing it and it was just going to be like a static image. When you go to Google, it just said Google with some sort of steel pan thing illustrated by me. Mm-hmm. And I kind of thought about it. I was like, the instrument is so unique. You have to include music. And I, know, and I knew sometimes they would do Google Doodles that you could press play and a little music would yeah, play yeah, or whatever. Yeah. So I... Basically, emailed the, the lady and I was like, hey, what do you think about like, adding some music in? She's like, yeah. She's like, do you know anyone who would, who would be good for this? And at the time, I was doing some work with um, Etienne Charles, who's a jazz musician, right? right? He's known for playing the trumpet. So I messaged him and I was like, hey, Etienne. I was like, you know anyone who, like, anyone who could do something with uh, doing a project with Steel Pan? I can't really talk too much about it. I was real vague about it, right? He was like, he's like, well, I've been playing pants since I'm a little boy. But Etienne is like a musical genius, right? Like this yeah, guy is, yeah, yeah, like top, top, top guy. Mm-hmm. So it didn't really surprise me that the man is also a great pan- panist as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so I put him in touch with Angelica from the Google Doodle team. And then they basically got in touch with Bugsy Sharp, who's he from Phase 2, right? Okay. And he basically came on board as well because he is like uh, one of the like most renowned um, pan composers in Trinidad, right? And so they brought on Bugsy and Etienne as the sort of musical side of it. And then we also decided at the same kind of the same time, we're like, let's also do an animation. Like, let's turn this into a story that's told through the visuals, right? So 
Angelica kind of told me, she's like, you, like, do you have an animator that you typically work with? Which I did, a guy named Mixi Gobin, who I actually work with at McCann. And I think he started, like, the month I started and maybe left McCann, like, three months after me. So we had a really, like, we shared almost the exact same time there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I work a lot with Mick still. Um, so Mick basically came on board to do the animation. And, yeah, at that point, because the scope of the project had expanded to be such a big thing, they were like, cool, we're going to do it in July 2021 instead. So it got pushed back a year. Right. Mm-hmm. So it, we're just working on that, working on that, working on that over the course of that year. It got to be like, I want to say like April or May, maybe May 2021. And we we're like about to kind of put the finishing touches. Things were kind of running behind a little bit as with most of these big projects where you have so many moving parts go. Mm-hmm. And basically... At that time, that's when Trinidad went back into lockdowns and we had real plenty COVID cases and yeah. things were, like that was when we got put on curfew, all that kind of thing. So um, Angelica from Google, she's basically like given the kind of sentiment with so many people dying daily, so many COVID cases, curfew, lockdown. She's like, it may be better suited to push this back now another year. It would then also right, give right. us an extra year of time to work on it. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think we were all like, yeah, cool. That definitely makes sense. So then it got pushed back another year. I think then my part, along with Mick, which was the animation, got finished in, I want to say like November 2021. So like a good seven or eight months before the actual project came out. I know they were still fine-tuning any music at the time. I actually didn't see the final piece until like maybe a week or two weeks before it launched live, right? So that was the first time I saw it like completely finished with all the finished animation, with all the finished music. And then it was supposed to come out July 26th. And so the day before that, I went, I was taking a little walk around the Savannah. I was walking home. All of a sudden, my phone just starts blowing up, right? And I was like, this is weird. <laughs> I was like, did I post something by mistake? Because like, at the time, I had like my, my website was about to update. The, I was like, I prepared everything to basically press publish. So that everything would have gone live now. Yeah. And I was like, I press publish and now I'm getting all these notifications because people have seen it. But what had happened was it was midnight in Japan and that was the first place it was launching. Mm-hmm. So I, was get, I went on to like Twitter and it was just like all these notifications in Japanese with screenshots. But you know, in Japan, the steel pan is really oh, yeah, big, right? True, so I mean, like hundreds of notifications, like blow mind, right? So then I was still like, you know what? I don't really want to post about it yet because no one in Trinidad knows about it and then all of a sudden it kind of started to filter through that this thing was coming right. but it wasn't live as yet right so I think I stayed I normally don't really stay up too late but I stayed up until midnight that night I was like I have to <laughs> see this yeah <laughs> granted we turned on our VPN and thing just to see it yeah? Yeah. Um, but I was like okay cool let me let me wait to see it live on like my version right mm-hmm. I went live on midnight and literally I think I take any day off uh, the, that day because I knew there would be like I'll, like I just wanted to kind of celebrate, so I just took the day off, yeah. and it was just like interview after interview, like people from every news outlet calling, people from ev- like literally, it was insane. I I so I got more messages by like nine o'clock that morning, and I got on my whole wedding day, right? <laughs> and fun fact, my wedding day was on my birthday, so that was like Shit. your thing now, your girl got like now Google by nine a.m. like way more messages, right? It was mad, 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 mad. Wait, but if, if the thing showing up on Google homepage, how is it associated with you? Like, how do people know it's you? Well, at first, no one really did. But when you click it, there's like an about. There's a whole web page devoted just to that. Mm-hmm. Right. So, and I would have had like the name of the team, et cetera, et cetera, and like a whole background on SteelPan as well. So when those things come out, people typically investigate who did it yeah, especially if it's a trinidadian theme Ex- one, huh? exactly yeah, sure, and sure. then i had i think i made like a tweet or something and i was like cats out of the bag this is, <laughs> this is what i've been working on for the last two years and then from there that obviously got shared all over the place so then people tied up who the team was you know life must not have felt real for that day like it was crazy i can't it was crazy that's insane. yeah hmm. that's actually crazy but wait going back how did you all how did you all decide how to represent the steel pan with that video? Yeah, so that was a little bit challenging, but we wanted something because it was so, like, you have to remember, this is like 15 to 20 illustrations. I think like 15 illustrations that then had to 
be animated to move, right? So it had mm. to be simple enough that the elements could be kind of deconstructed for animation. And any animation style had to be simple enough that we could do a minute and a, I think it's like a minute and 10 seconds long animation, keeping in mind that we have changes to make and stuff. But we wanted to give it a feel of like historic prevalence, I guess. So uh, that's why we went with that sort of um, not super bright color palette. It was like a very muted color palette. Yeah. Um, so we wanted it to feel kind of raw because that is what the steel pan is, you know? Like, I think something like super flashy and high definition would not have really suited the steel pan that well. You know, the steel pan is, a, is an instrument that comes from oppression. It comes from, like, revolution and fight back and things. So we really wanted it to not be something that looked flashy. It had to kind of have that sort of rootsy vibe tit, you know? How long it took you to come up with how you're actually going to do it? To be honest with you, I don't know. <laughs> Hours, <laughs> days, but it was tough because at the end of the day, like, <clears throat> it's not just, hey, you go, this is it. This is the style. It's like, you have to create the style. You have to create many styles and see what works and present it to Google, see what they say. Google also had an internal team of people from Trinidad that they brought together to also <laughs> be able to, to like, yeah, give feedback and stuff, right? And unlike most jobs, I can talk to anyone about it. So I was very insulated in terms of feedback. It was really feedback from the team and feedback from the Google team. There was no, like, I couldn't message, like, my designer friends and my artist friends. and be like, hey, check this out. What do you think? You know, it was very insulated. So that was kind of challenging. But, I mean, I, the amount of different variations of styles that we tried and that kind of thing... It was, yeah, I mean, it took a, a long, long time. Like, what you see there isn't just by accident. Mm -hmm. Here, we drew this, take it. You know, it was, it was a long process, a, a lot of iterations, a lot of trying it with color, trying it with bright colors, trying it with muted colors, you know. And, yeah, so that was pretty much how we kind of came to that, you know. Mm -hmm. But also, that's, like, such a career-defining moment. And I feel like you must have dealt with a lot of internal conflict, like, trying to figure out what's the perfect thing me to do like this is my time this is my opportunity how you yeah how you dealt with that like yeah that's it, stress especially by crazy. yourself it was real stress and like even i was like god i like i was like it's with such a big project spanning so many people spanning such a big team like i was like we're gonna put something in here that's people are not gonna like we're gonna like at the end of the day like that is such a big job that represents trinidad tobago represents the caribbean represents our music you know represents one of our inventions at the end of the day yeah, don't. you don't want people to come out and be like this is crap like yeah, who did this stress. this is crap yeah, yeah. so it was it was extremely stressful but then when you realize that the feedback coming in is mostly positive then you kind of okay you calm down a bit obviously with something that's seen by so many people you're always going to have a one or two people course, in between yeah, you, you can't make something that everyone likes like that is literally the definition of life right so um yeah, I mean, it was very stressful on the day. Just hoping, like, oh my god, I hope people like this. You know, that was really what it was because it was a, because, as I said, it was something that had to represent all of us. Yeah, that you know? was a big job, bro. That was really a yeah. big job. Like people who design logos for like our country, I don't really envy them. You know, because that <laughs> is how do you div how do you how do you even start doing that? You know, it's a it's a big job. You know, mm -hmm. I never even thought of that. You know, yeah. Do you have any other ones lined up that you can tell us about? Did you just wink? Yeah, I have a couple. I have a couple. I have a couple. <laughs> <laughs> I have a few. I have a few jobs I'm working on now. That's kind of taken up all my time. There are two murals. One is for a fet, and then one is for something else, which I can't really allude to or hint at right now. But I would say in the next like month, check me on Instagram, and you'll probably see it. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've, I'm. Super happy. I, like, I've, I've put so much work in over the years that it's, it's nice to see. And I'm actually, like, it's really only this year that everything has kind of snowballed into what it has become. And it has been, like, many, many years, many hours, days of, of hard work, you know. It's not just an overnight success, you know. Yeah, people probably see that you started the company in 2019 and they say this man doing work for Google and things. Yeah. In, in a however much years. But you man working way before that. Yeah, for sure, <laughs> for sure. Hours. Yeah. I think that's kind of an important takeaway for anyone listening, you know, like, if you want to do something, it might take 10 years for it to really all kind of pay off, you know, but once you keep pushing, like, even you all with the, with the podcast, you know, it might take 
30 videos before you hit 10,000 views or, yeah. or whatever your, your gauge of success in terms of views are, you know? So it really is just about doing it and pushing because I guarantee you like 99.9% .9 of people give up after a few months of doing anything. You know, it's really those people who stick it out will see the, lo the success long, long, longer down the road, you know? Yeah, for sure. Do you think that, like, hmm, let me say this, boy. Do you think that, like, for certain people, there's something they could work at real hard towards and not become successful, and they could be, like, a, a point where they, sh they should know that they shouldn't do that thing? 100%. <laughs> if you suck, dog. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, I don't know. I, don't, I, I wouldn't really know how to define that, but I think you as an individual could be like, okay, cool, like, I'm giving myself X amount of time and these are like my, this is my roadmap to success. So I think that if you just have like a big goal, it's kind of hard to hit, but if you have a steps to take and you're like, cool, the first step you want to do is hit, whatever, using y'all as an example, you want to hit 100 subscribers. Then the next step you want to do is we want to get a video that gets viral by whatever definition, you know, and you, you build and you build and you build and those little steps along your roadmap keep you going, you know, it's not just about why don't we have 100,000 followers or why aren't we as big as Mr. Beast, you know, like, <laughs> or whatever, like, why aren't we, I don't know, yeah, a yeah. huge podcast, you know, but it takes time, you know. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. Even like um, the biggest podcast in the world is the Joe Rogan Experience. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And that man has been doing it for like years, like 12 years, before podcasts were even popular or a thing, you know, now everyone has a podcast, you know, yeah. there's so many podcasts and most podcasts don't even go past 10 episodes. So it's like, I think I read somewhere online, it's like, if you have a podcast and it goes, goes past, ten, I think it was 10 or 20 episodes, you are already in like the 0.01% of podcasts. So your chance of success is that much higher, you know? So like, when you start learning these little small things, it's like, wow, okay, cool. Mm -hmm. Once you work hard, you are already set yourself apart, you know? Yeah. I actually saw a recent study where, I think it's like, what was it, boy? Probably 70% of podcasts don't reach past three episodes. And then after that, 90% of that don't reach past 21. Yeah, that must be the exact same thing that I yeah. saw. And that is wild. Commitment. Very, you right. know, that's wild. But I mean, it's easy to start doing something, but it's hard when you're like, gosh, do I feel to do this tonight? Whatever, whatever. It's like, and you lose that sort of initial energy and excitement. You know, it's, it's, it's hard work, you know, which you all will find out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, you know, once you stick to it, I think the path of success is there, you know. And luckily for us as well, we got a lot of good positive feedback from everybody. So, you know, it's a good motive. It's good motivation. For sure, for sure. You know? And as with everything, your first customers or for your like your first viewers are probably gonna be like friends and family. Yeah. Then you build from there, you know. So you kind of build your circle and if if one person listens, they might tell two they might tell two people and then those two people might tell two people and it just becomes something where it, multiplies it's not adding it's multiplying you know yeah. so you get to a point where all of a sudden you have hundreds of thousands of listeners because you grew from that that initial seed that told two people that told two people and it just mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. spreads out yeah. and yeah. then it gets to the point where people are coming are asking to come on the podcast and we gotta beg people to come on and get a bunch of nose i think exactly yeah. exactly that's, that's our sweet spot basically yeah for sure and people are like wait i really want to be on that podcast you know and that might be someone's measure of success for themselves you know yeah. i want to be able to to get asked to be on a podcast like how cool would that be you know yeah that's true i think it's important to love what you're doing too because even, even though we're not making any money or anything from this look who i sit down with and look who i'm learning <laughs> yeah. from you know yeah that's great again to do this every month i have a real fun <laughs> i have a real fun <laughs> this is real this is yeah and but it really it really makes you realize how like how things work like it's all we had to do was message you and now you're here. Like, people have this weird, like, perception about, like, things, things are, like, magic, you know? Yeah, you all messaged me, like, what, six days ago, maybe? <laughs> Not even a week ago, probably. probably. Like, yeah. literally, like, six days ago, hey, we're doing a podcast, you know, be on it. I quickly, like, did my little due diligence. I was like, who are these people? Checked out. And actually, the, the whole, like, set and everything was, a, was like, hey, this is a proper, proper thing, right? Yeah. And I saw you all had Zach, and I was like, all right, cool. Zach is a CIC boy as well. Clearly, y'all have good taste. <laughs> y'all have good taste in guests. Um, so, yeah, I mean, yeah. That's all it takes, you know? That's true. She needs to reach out. Yeah. And not be scared of rejection because, you know, we'd be getting that. For sure. 
And of course, yeah, for sure. And you know? that goes back to what you said earlier about applying to Macan when you didn't think you had the credentials to get a job. Exactly. So tell us a little bit more about backyard designs. Um, like how much people do you have employed? Tell us about your biggest clients. Anything? Sure. Yeah. So backyard design, as I kind of mentioned before, we specialize in branding and packaging design and illustrations. Mm. We do social media content. We do TikTok content. We do like all these other things that we don't really, I guess, push and talk about. But maybe we will start doing doing that a bit more. Mm -hmm. um, but right now, if you go on our website, for instance, you will see mostly branding, packaging, illustrations, right? So um, right now, it is the team consists of me as like, I guess, the quote unquote founder or creative lead. Um, then we have two client service. So they basically deal with the clients, deal with all the basic administrative side of things, right? Mm -hmm. When it comes to clients. Um, then we have uh, because it's like a virtual assistant who handles all the e incoming emails. Mm -hmm. So they would basically get all the incoming emails, sort of filter it in terms of what each client falls under, whether they come in for a logo on, on a full brand identity, whether they come in because they want a t-shirt design, whether they come in because of whatever. That um, the virtual assistant would then send them an onboarding email that would typically have a questionnaire that they would fill out. And then from there, one of the client service people would sort of take control based on their responses in the, in the Google form. Then right now, I have one other graphic designer working with me, but she's going to do her master's in September and is actually leaving the team at the end of February. So February is her last month, wow. which we're very sad about because she's super, super talented. <laughs> um, and we're actually hiring, or we have hired two new designers who will be starting with us from February 1st. So for February, we'll have three designers plus me. And from March, after the first designer leaves, we'll then have two designers. So right now, we're kind of in flux. But when it does settle, there will be four, like six of us, I guess. Um, and then, of course, we also have um, many freelancers that we then outsource, whether that's photographers, videographers, um, Mick who handles all the animation. We have a lot of copywriters that we work with. Um, for writing, we have bas we basically have like freelancers for everything for the TikTok content. We work with a super talented group of people who kind of specialize in TikTok. So we kind of handle that that stuff on a project to project basis, um, where we kind of outsource things. But yeah, right now, right now that's a core team, and then we kind of expand based on the needs of each client, right? Yeah. You're mm -hmm. doing a lot for such a small team. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah, we have a high output. <laughs> um, but the thing is, is that we normally give ourselves really long lead, lead times on projects. Mm -hmm. So even though you might be seeing like stuff coming out now, that's stuff that I would have worked on like months ago and would have taken a long time to complete. You know, So like, for instance, the mural that I did at C3, that kind of got released in December. But I was working on that in like July, August, right? Mm -hmm. July, August, September, October. It was like a four month process, right? So I give myself a long enough time that I could be working on multiple things at once. There are certain things that are day to day and I'll be like, hey, we need this now for now. Um, but I try my best to avoid those types of projects. Um, but it happens every now and then. Like I just put out a video on my Instagram the other day with Kess's managers calling me at like, Literally, it was like 10 o'clock at night on a Thursday, and they're like, hey, we bring out a song tomorrow, and we need artwork. Tomorrow. Yeah, and I was like, I was like, I am actually right now out, <laughs> so you all need to call me in the morning. So next morning, at like, they gave me, they then texted me, like, what they wanted. So I woke up, I was like, well, I was out, but I wasn't drinking, so I was, well, woke up relatively fresh. We go around, I think it was like 5.30 in the morning, yeah. did a little exercise, sat on my desk around half past six, started, and then... By the time I got in touch with them, it was like 10 o'clock. And I had sent them what I had done in the morning. And they were like, eh, no, try this, 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 and made some changes. And then I then had like two hours to then re-illustrate something else. Um, and then, yeah, the song was out at 2 p.m. on <laughs> YouTube. You know, So you do get those, pro those types of projects, right? But at the end of the day, those are the, that kind of client who I've been working with for years, I don't mind kind of giving them a bligh and, and helping them out, you know? So especially when, when you have that time frame, you have a lot of creative freedom because it's not really 
too much that you could adjust and change and be back and forth with, you know? So you're kind of like, okay, cool. You're really, when you have like three hours or four hours to do this, let's, let's do it. <laughs> um, but like something like a logo or something, I would typically need like three to four weeks to work on just because so much thought has to go into that. And the length of time that that logo or that brand has to last for is a lot longer than, let's say, album art or, or like a single art trick, you know? Mm. Yeah. So I kind of look at it like that as well. But yeah, so we do have a high output, but it's really because we give ourselves the necessary time to work on those projects, you know? And it, it, yeah, it does. A lot of times we have to turn down jobs that is like, I would love to work on this, but I just know that I can't give you what you need or like as good a job that I would want to give you yeah. because of the short time, time, time frame on a job, you know? So you end up losing a little bit of work, but I, I think long term is the best play. 100%. And besides that Google Doodle one, which one was your favorite to work on? Um, that's a hard question. You know, I've, I've done a lot of work over the years and like, one of, I was to go back to this project as one of my favorites, which is the Gina's Midnight Hummingbird Chocolate Bar. I and saw that on YouTube. Yeah, and that project, I mean, I did that so long ago, and I did that in like 2017. I did that before I left McCann, actually. And that was really one of the first jobs where I was like, cool, I'm going to integrate packaging, branding, illustration, all in one, which are the jobs that I really love doing. So yeah. like, I kind of look back at that, and even now, like six years later, I think it still holds up really well. Which a lot of times you look back at work you did six years ago and you're like, eh, I'll change that a little bit. But I look back at it and I'm like, this is still a project that I feel proud of. Yeah. Um, then I guess like doing that Johnny Walker mural was really cool because the, once again, they hired me to like create something just including their brand. Mm -hmm. The McDonald's, um, McDonald's illustrations that I did for the commemorative cups. Yeah. That was really cool as well. That was a short time frame and I was actually on vacation. Oh, Lord. Yeah, I was like... I'd literally taken a week off of work and they called me like on a Monday and they were like, yeah, we need this for Friday. And I was like, no. So the whole vacation there. The like, whole vacation no, mashup. No, no, no. And, I was yeah. and I was traveling to her. Oh, and I was like, ah. Uh, Why if he goes then? Yeah. <laughs> yeah she, she knows how it is, right? She, yeah. She's been in, in her own business long, longer than, true, longer true, than true. most people I know, you know? So yeah, I had to basically spend my vacation working on those, <laughs> on those cups. But because I'd taken all, I'd basically... Had no work planned, so I was like, cool, three illustrations in a week for McDonald's for the 10 year anniversary of them being in Trinidad, all kind of representing Trinidad. I was like, this is something that I think could be like a really worthwhile portfolio piece, you know? So I was like, cool, I'll do it. And so, yeah, that was a, that was a really fun project, and I still have those cups at home. I, can, I do look back fondly at that project as well, even though it was on my vacation, yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, all the work I've done for Kess over the years has been really, really fun. And that also, that job came about because I post so many illustrations on Instagram all the time. And one of them was a, just a drawing I did of Kess, right? In like mm -hmm. a very kind of unique style. And I guess someone sent it to him. I think it might have been Oliver Milne, who's a friend of mine who does his music videos. And he literally DM'd me and was like, what's your number? And I sent him my number, and I'm kind of like, uh, is Kess going to call me now? Like, <laughs> what's happening? And that was, yeah, that was during Carnival, and it was Carnival 2020. Carnival 2020, yeah. So it was, yeah. like, literally the last Carnival before the COVID lo lockdowns, right? Um, and I was like, is Kess going to call me now? But he just never called, right? And I was like, ah, that's kind of weird. But I was like, whatever, maybe, maybe you'll call me, like, later on or something. It's Carnival, busy, whatever, whatever, whatever. Um, I had also done a parody music video of Kess's Savannah Grass called Sahara Dust uh, the year before that, right? Serious. Yeah, and I was like, I kind of went from doing parody videos, now I'm working with him on like actual stuff, and I was like, that's real cool. Um, and yeah, so like in July, he reached out to me and he's like, hey, I'm doing a live album. Do you want to do all the artwork fit? And I was like, yeah, yeah. sign me up. Of I'm in lockdown and... I'm in lockdown in England. I'm like, I'd love to work on your live album. Um, so that was kind of how that relationship start, start, started with him. Um, and then at the time, he had just gotten two new managers, a guy named Damon and a guy named Evan, who were both based in New York. So I worked kind of primarily with them. And the process of that would be, I would kind of get on a call with Kess. We'd speak for like an hour and a half and just go over like all his ideas, all my ideas, 
what we think will work. And then from there, it was like, cool. Now I deal with his managers. And then from time to time, I would send stuff to him depending on the workflow. But typically, I'd deal with his managers. And each project would kind of start off with me communicating directly with him and doing like a brainstorm right. or whatever the case is. Or like, they will send me a song and be like, Take a vibe of this, let me know what you think. So like Licky Ticky, for instance, that was kind of how that came about. Or like Jolene, they sent me Jolene in like January of last year. And they were like, just listen to it, take it in a little while. I feel I'm like, cool, I get to listen to new cast music, like yeah, unreleased stuff, un- unreleased stuff you know? so, which is real cool. Um, so yeah, that, that's kind of how that process works. So it's, it's been a lot of projects that I've been really fortunate to be able to work on, you know. Um, after the Google Doodle, um, we got hired by Republic Bank to do the independence like video. So we did a full animation for, Indi- for Republic Bank for Independence Day, which was another really short time for me. I had like three weeks to do a 30-second animation, oh, which was a real... Sh- that was another like super tight deadline. But once again, one of those projects where you're like, this could be really, really cool. And it, came, it turned out really nicely, but it didn't really give us a lot of time for changes in the end. So it was pretty much the client used more or less what we what our vision was you right. know so you got to work on a lot of cool things you know so obviously your company is fairly young and you have a lot of years to go so what do you think is the future for backyard design right now we are sort of planning obviously most of our clients right now are either based in trinidad and tobago the trinidad and tobago diaspora and caribbean other caribbean islands so our goal right now is how do we now expand into a more international global market? So we're trying to figure out like, cool, how are we going to be pushing to get clients in the US, clients in Europe, clients in Latin America, where, wherever, you know? So that's kind of what we are striving for right now. Um, of course, in Trinidad, you have like the whole foreign exchange problem, getting foreign exchange. So I look at like, a business like mine or something that could bring in and attract a lot of, of foreign exchange dollars, you know, because I'm not necessarily selling a good, I'm, like, I'm selling a service that anyone, anywhere, anywhere could purchase and send money, money back to Trinidad, you know. So that's kind of how I'm pl- making plans and trying to figure out how best to go about doing that. Um, and of course, you know, just continuing to do quality work, you know, because at the end of the day, if your standards start slipping and you start putting out work that's not as good, that's when things could go downhill really quickly. So at the, the top priority for us is always to put out quality work. And if that means literally like taking on less clients, we'll do it. If it means having to hire more people, we'll do it. So at the end of the day, that is our goal is to continue doing quality work. Um, and yeah, just see how, how best we could build the business even more, scale up a little bit, start working with more international clients. All these things are in motion. And of course, it's, it's a lot to manage yeah. with such a small team. But I think that the portfolio that we've built for ourselves with clients like Google, Johnny Walker, McDonald's, Angostura, like we have so many great clients that we've been fortunate to work with that most, like I'm 32, and like most 32-year-olds 32 32 year would not have had opportunities to work on such big international clients, you know? So... I definitely want to sort of leverage the opportunities that I've gotten into more opportunities. Nice, I'm pretty sure you could do it. You seem like you're on a good, <laughs> a strong I path. Appreci- right I now. appreciate that. In a strong path, right? Well, as you talk about um, expanding the team, if you may have to do that, you probably will. But how do you, especially for the graphic designers, how do you vet them to hire them? Because in a way, they're kind of representing you. So yeah. do you look for, like, what do you look for? That's a real, real good question. It's tough. Um, it's tough to find people who would fit in well with the team and sort of be able to work within, I don't want to say our style because at the end of the day, an agency shouldn't have a style or a studio shouldn't have a style because at the end of the day, we are designing for a wide range of clients. So we, mm. we have a lot of corporate work that you might see and will never know that we did it, right? So I think that being a versatile designer is very important. I think having experience with clients is important because at the end of the day, you don't want, if, if you hire a designer fresh out of school, they may not necessarily be accustomed to getting the sort of feedback you get from clients and it may kind of stress them out. And then something that you only really figure out later on is how well does this person work within timelines and deadlines? Because at the end of the day, it's important to me that 
we meet our deadlines no matter what, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm very open with everyone I work with. It's like, if you don't think you can get this done in this timeline, let me know up front so that I could then talk to the client and say we need a few extra days. But if I tell a client, again, it's Wednesday, and I am like, okay, where is it? And you can't give it to me till Thursday, then... Yeah, yeah I have problems. Yeah, you have some issues. <laughs> um, but in terms of... I just went through the hiring process, hired two, two new designers, and really and truly, you kind of look at everything. Like, I don't really take into consideration the resume that 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 much i do look and see if they have agency um agency like work history because that then i think personally that if you've worked at an agency you kind of have a built-in education of how things work um i look at also the clients they've worked with the type of work that they put in out how they present themselves online because that's so important these days and of course when you're working with clients you have to be really cognizant of like how are my clients presenting themselves online so if you're a designer and your, your personal brand maybe is a little bit all over the place or your logo in your icon on instagram isn't looking good or whatever the case is you take all those things into consideration yeah. even sometimes you'll get a portfolio from someone and you get their resume and it's like who designed this you know so it's like even the design of that person's resume is very important you know all these different things because at the end of the day we can even if you're designing a label for something, that is layout, you know? So if you, if you can't design a simple layout like a resume, then I can't see how you could design the layout of like packaging for something, you know? So, That's yeah. And then of course, like personality-wise, how do I think this person will mesh with the team? Do I think that they will be, I don't know, a pain? Do I think they're gonna be whatever? Like there's all these different things you kind of take into consideration, but also to, not that I've had this, this um, happened to me before, but I think that also having the guts to be like three months in, okay, cool, this isn't working. Let me get rid of this of this designer from the team. And it could be for whatever re reason, not necessarily that they're a bad designer, but maybe they're not fitting in within the clientele that you have or whatever the case yeah. is. As I said, I haven't had to do that. I haven't had been put in that position, but I'm definitely planning for that to be a reality one day, you know? All right. Yeah. Well, I, I kind of want to move on to the NFTs before we reach the rapid round. So <laughs> I want to know um, what, what kind of sparked that interest in, in that field? So what happened, boy? What is the story? What is the story here? So it was like early 2021 mm -hmm. and there was an artist named Beeple and he had sold a piece at auction for like 69 million US. So everyone oh was yeah, like, yeah, what? Was and so at that time, that was kind of my first time kind of hearing about NFTs within the mainstream. I kind of seen a chat about it on Twitter and online and stuff. But it was very, it was commonly referred to as crypto art, yeah, right? Okay. And I was kind of like, what does that mean? Are people like drawing Bitcoins? Like what, what is crypto art? And I, I would kind of see it and not really understand it and even look into it. And me personally i'm very technologically averse right like i know what i know like i know certain things but like you put me in front of like excel or anything i am just like not good right and i'm also like impatient with those things as well so right. when i started hearing about like wallets and this and that putting your money and whatever i was like this is above my above my head a little bit right and then this guy sold a piece for 69 million dollars and i was like hmm <laughs> there might be something here you know <laughs> yeah so i was like cool started kind of looking into it and then around the same around that same time um someone i went to university with a lady my name of stephanie telemark her and her now fiance stephen hardy jr they were like listen we think your art that you've been posting online would actually be really well suited for nfts do you want to jump on a call I was like, yeah, sure. I was like, I'm now kind of hearing about it and to think about it. Um, so we jumped on a call. They literally spent like an hour and a half to two hours on a Zoom call with me, sharing screens, showing me the metaverse, wallets, this, 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 like really setting me up for what was to come, right? right. Um, so I created a wallet on MetaMask, like did all these different things. And then um, a friend of mine, Sekani Solomon, he was minting nfts on a website called foundation which is an invite only um, nft marketplace so it's very kind of like highly sought after to be on foundation foundation is actually now open to anyone but at the time it was invite only 
Second, he had made a couple sales, so he had invitations to give. So when you make a sale, you get you got like three invitations, and he sent me an invitation. So it's like cool on this thing now. At the time I was doing my um, alphabet series, which I do every year, which is the Caribbean architectural alphabet. So I basically create the alphabet, A, A to Z, and then zero to nine in the style of Caribbean architecture, right? So I was like, cool, this might be a good first NFT to create, right? Mm -hmm. So I put all together on a six by six grid, put it up for sale on foundation. I put it up in May of 2021. So from March to May, I was kind of like, I just went into a deep dive, try to learn as much as possible. I was like, cool, I'm gonna make my first NFT, gonna mm -hmm. like see the millions start rolling in any time <laughs> now, right? That NFT sat down, unsold for like months, from like May to October, right? Mm -hmm. And then it eventually got sold in October, but I had to like, I significantly reduced the price of, of what it was. And it got bought, funnily enough, by someone who was basically collecting NFTs from artists from every country in the world. So oh, the cool. only reason my NFT got sold is because he reached Trinidad and I was like the only the available only one. one, right? Um, so I kind of get through there a little bit. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, that sold and like literally uh, like a, a switch just flipped in my head and I was like, cool, I'm going all in. Then I realized like you can't just sell it and you can't just put up an NFT and sell it, right? I think that's kind of the misconception a little bit that people are like, oh, well, if I put up my artwork, uh, it will sell. But at any day... With NFTs, what's the good thing and the bad thing? The good thing is that you have op you're open to a global audience. Anyone could buy from you, right? You don't have to ship anything. You don't have to be in a gallery in New York for someone in New York to buy. Like literally, anyone could go online and buy your art trick. Now, the flip side of that is is that you're not competing with literally everyone else in the world for attention. You're not just competing with the other people in the gallery or the other people in your city or town or country or island or whatever. Yeah. You're competing with everybody. And let me tell you something. They have some people out there who create crazy, crazy art and they're like 13 years old on Reddit. <laughs> so it's like, when, when you realize the kind of insane, insane like skill levels out there and like literal children, mm. like, into, like 14 year old kids on YouTube creating like insane illustrations, then you're like, okay, cool. How do I set myself up to be able to sell in this oversaturated market where People are like, they have a lot of super like skilled illustrators or artists mm -hmm. or whatever. So then you realize, cool, the core of NFTs and the core of all this is community building. So you realize, okay, I can't just put something up and expect it to sell because right. like one of the biggest NFT marketplaces is called OpenSea. Mm -hmm. And it literally is like throwing something in the OpenSea and hoping someone buys it. It's like, no, mm -hmm. you need to build a community, right? So that's kind of the first step. Like, how do I... Now, find a community of people or build a community of people who would want to support my work or whatever the case is. Um, and there are like kind of pockets of Caribbean NFT communities around the place. And to be honest, most of my collectors, like 90% of my collectors who have collected and bought my NFTs are all Trinidad based or like people that I know. So I am like in that position of now starting where it's like, Friends, family, like people that I know kind of directly by. Like I haven't really reached that threshold of uh, like th strangers buying my work. There have been a few pieces where I'm like, I have no idea who this person is. I don't know where they found me or how they found me or why they bought it, but they bought it. But it it's not reached that point as yet. So I'm still in that really early phase of it. Right. Um, so yeah, that's kind of, I guess... I think the question was how my NFT journey started and that was kind of how the journey started. So it started with that conversation in like March, yeah. then minting my first piece in May and then it being sold in October. And then from October, that's when I kind of went like pedal to the floor and let's go all the way with this, you know? See the magnificence of on I really like those that you did. Thank you. I think if I was to see Fatima <laughs> instead, of, instead of curiosity, <laughs> I would lose my mind. That would look real hard. Yeah. Oh, look at that. But um, you have a thought about, because you know how they have, like, NFTs that are just the, what do you call it, a JPEG? Oh, you mean, that's just a joke that people just say, and, like, it's not real, it's just... I know, just but, like, they have NFTs that are just the artwork, and then they also have NFTs that kind of have an attachment to some kind of value or... Um, like, a, like a private club or something. Right, like so that. like body upon these yeah. types yeah. of projects. Where you have some kind of ad, 
advantage over other people who don't have it rather than just the appreciation of the asset yeah. itself? Yeah. Yeah. Never so thought about... I think yeah, what you're referring to is what they call the utility of an right, NFT, right, right? Right, right? So you have NFTs, like you have like the Body Yacht Club um, collection, which is like super expensive now, right? Yeah. But at the original sale price would have been relatively low, like a fraction of a percentage compared to, to what they're selling now, right? So, but what those projects do, those projects act as almost like, um, like fundraising for like a business, right? So they put out a bunch, uh, with the, like with the board ape example, they put out 10,000 and they sold out in however long and they got, I don't know how, exactly how much it would have sold for the time. Maybe let's say $200 US, right? So they would have made 200 by 10,000 and they would have basically had that and then they can now build a business based on that. And now they do events, they do all sorts of different things. They put out new projects, they have like all sorts of, like a whole ecosystem around this, right? right. So that is a little bit different to what I do because what they are doing is, and this is something I think will sort of, like you'll bridge that gap in the, in the future basically where, everything kind of falls under NFTs now, right? So, like, when you think of anything, it's just NFTs, right? Whereas what I do is, I would say, like, digital art being sold on the blockchain. What Board Ape Yacht Club is doing is they have created, essentially, a membership club that you get access to certain things, whether it's events or whatever, and the access is through holding that NFT. So that is more like a gated community, and that's your membership card to it. Then you have... Um, you have all sorts of different things. You have music NFTs. There's all these different sub-genres of NFTs, but right now everything is just kind of clumped as this is an NFT, right? right. So I think we're going to see some uh, time where no one really talks about Web3, Web blockchain, NFTs. It's just going to be a situation where it's like, oh yeah, I own this digital art. Look at it in my online gallery. And it's, everything's going to be run on the technology, in the same way that like now you go on Facebook where you're not like, oh, I'm, I'm using the internet, right? You just say I'm on Facebook or you don't say I'm watching Netflix and Netflix membership. You're not saying, oh, my, I have a membership. You just say I'm using Netflix, you know? So it's going to get to that point. But right now there's such a small percentage of people globally that use it that it's just easier to use that language to communicate. But then it also is a little bit... Um, like it kind of turns pe people away, right? Because it's like, it seems very technolo technology based, you know? Mm -hmm. But trust me, if I could do it, literally anybody could <laughs> do it because I'm not technologically advanced at all. So, what do people have to do to buy your NFTs? Like, what would I have to do? I have yeah. To go out to buy so, them. that is the next kind of hard part about onboarding anyone. But basically, what you need to do is you create a wallet, uh, a crypto wallet. Right. You don't have to load that crypto wallet with cryptocurrency which is normally done through another exchange, right? So I'll just use the most like common ones. Now you, you first go on the exchange, which is Binance. You buy crypto on Binance. Then you have to transfer the crypto from Binance to your Metamask wallet, which is if we'll, just use, we'll use Ethereum as an example, as a cryptocurrency. Metamask is a Ethereum wallet. Mm -hmm. So you convert it from Binance, you transfer it from Binance to Metamask in your wallet. Then you basically go on to, to the marketplace. You just click connect wallet. Connecting your wallet is like the NFT or Web3 equivalent of like going to Facebook and clicking continue with Google, mm -hmm. right? So it's basically your login, right? Okay. So you connect your wallet and then you could click buy on, the, on whatever NFT you want. Right. Once, once it's available for sale. So it's like a three-step, four-step process. Um, but it is a little bit like challenging, I guess, for people yeah. who have no idea or people who are for very sure, new. So sure. there is a lot of information online, YouTube and stuff that teaches you how to do all this. Um, but maybe the better way of doing it is basically getting someone who's done it before and having them help, help you out, you know? So like I've helped out friends do their NFT, their crypto wallets or whatever the case is, you know? All right. Yeah. You know, when my crypto go back up, I buy now. Right, right now we're not looking too good. No, no, no. It's going back up now though. It's going back up now. Yeah, slowly but surely. Yeah. On like 66 plus <laughs> yeah all right well i ready for the rapid round you had any rapid question i'll think of some all right, okay. do you have any crypto by the way 
Yeah. You must have crypto from his NFTs. Yeah. Oh, you got shit in crypto. You had before that, though? Cash it out. I literally did not buy a single dollar of crypto until I started minting NFTs. The <laughs> first crypto I bought was to pay the gas to mint my NFTs. Oh, gas. Yes. Yeah. And so that's very complicated. Yeah, that's like a whole <laughs> other level. So basically, the gas fee is like, if I know how busy the network is, it varies the gas fee, but it's basically, you know when people say they mine Ethereum? Oh, yeah. They basically like, add any computing power, right? right? So to, for you to do anything on the blockchain, to make any adjustment to the blockchain, you need to pay gas because you have to pay for the computing power of what you're trying to do. Yeah. Back in the, like, bull run, mm-hmm. the gas was like, you will go to buy an NFT for, like, let's say $200, and the gas might be, like, $100. Yeah. What? Or more. And now, the gas on anything is less than 10 US. Because yeah, there's so such that. few relative to like the bull run. Because it'll be like a backup of transactions to be processed, so you gotta do a little bit to push it through. Correct. Oh, that's crazy. All right, guys, well, we had an entity rapid round where we asked some quick questions with quick answers. <laughs> All right, so the first question I have for you, Nicholas, is your job requires you to be at peak creativeness all the time, right? When you fall off that peak, what activities do you resort to to kind of get a reset or to, you know? Yeah, I would say, quick answer, going for a walk. Literally, go to the savannah, walk the savannah. I tend to walk through the savannah, so I'll walk on the grass rather than walk right next to the road. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of my activity that I go to to reset. Okay. No, no phone, maybe some music, but typically just go on a walk. And when you know started the business, how do you learn about the business side? Because you obviously had a lot of experience on the artistic design side. But yeah. um, trial and error. But I would say somehow it kind of came a bit naturally to me. So I was kind of lucky for that. But yeah, trial and error, practice. Yeah. All right. If you had to start over, no links, no, um, no experience, no nothing, what blueprint would you give yourself? Um, just... Start doing something, choose a niche, and double down on it, and just go for it. What, whatever that may be, mm-hmm. yeah. And you've obviously been very successful for the short period of time that you've been doing that. How do you not let that go to your head? Because you just know that it literally, like, <laughs> you might go through a phase of like getting no clients. So at the end of the day, it's like humble. Yeah, <laughs> you are forever humbled by the fact that like anything could happen. You know, like you. You might be going through a good moment now, but you might be going through a bad moment in the future, and you really just need to keep your head on your shoulders and, and l- know the vision and keep going towards it, you know? All right. You can't say nothing, but if you couldn't do art at all, what do you think your career would be right now? That's a good question. Um, I could see myself doing well in sales, to be honest, mm. but I think my... my life mission was, would have always been to be in some sort of business. Right. So I would have probably just, if I had like literally nothing to do and no ideas, I would just choose something and bring it in and maybe try to sell, sell it to people or develop something and sell it, you know? Right. And this is a little generic, but what is a typical daily life of Nicholas Huggins? That is very hard to quantify, but like I could give you... Give us a busy day. Yeah, yeah. I'll give you a busy day. Today was a busy day. So it's kind of hard because, okay, so... I try to have all my meetings on a Monday. I'll give you a little, maybe like a three days of the week kind of thing, because that's probably the like best average. Mm. So like on a Monday, I'll typically wake up relatively early, like half past six or so, kind of get my day. I like to ease into my day a little bit, you know? Wake up, do Riddle, play some Mario Kart, oh, maybe like exercise. Um, wake up, go, up, well, go upstairs to my office, I uh, then usually my team meets at 10 a.m. on a Monday, every Monday. And then I try to set up all my meetings for the week. Or like if someone messages me the week before and they say they want to meet, I'll put all my meetings kind of back to back on a Monday morning, right? right? So I'll have like, this morning I had like a meeting at 10, I might meet at 11, I meet at 12. And then in between, every meeting ends at 10.30, I'll spend the next 30 minutes preparing for the other meeting or whatever. Or if I could get a, maybe some emails or something in between. Then I'd spend the afternoon pretty much designing whatever I'm working on. So like today I was working on a mural. Um, so I worked on that until about 3.30. And then I go to the gym Monday, Mondays from 
or 30th, so I leave for my like four or so. Um, yeah, and then, so I go to the gym on a Monday afternoon. Oh, afternoon. I thought it was morning. No, nah, no, nah, nah, afternoon, afternoon. <laughs> 4 a.m., that's great. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I go to the gym, come back home. Normally, I will do some more work. So like, because in the night, you kind of get uninterrupted design time. So I'd normally come back home from the gym, and then I'd work, like shower, eat dinner, and probably work from like 7 till 9 or 7 till 10, go to sleep. Tuesday, wake up, exercise in the morning um, from like maybe 6 to 7 or so. Then I would normally start work at like 7, 30, 8. And I typically design until lunchtime. And then around midday, I try to kind of get out of the house. I normally go get like a coffee or something somewhere okay. um, or do whatever. And then in between, get calls and then design all afternoon pretty much. And then maybe go for a run or something. That's kind of the two versions of my day. I think I hear the answer in that daily life, but what does Nicholas like to do in his free time besides that? <laughs> um, that's a good question. What do I like to do? I love taking in like random content. So like I love being on YouTube. I love listening to podcasts. Um, I think I listen to podcasts every single day on Spotify. Mm -hmm. um, YouTube, I'm kind of like sometime-ish on it. Yeah. I bought a Nintendo Switch over Christmas for myself. So... I've been dabbling in the Nintendo Switch, but I try not to play. I probably play for like 25 minutes a day, maybe. Mm. Yeah, not even every day, maybe like 25 minutes every four days. Um, yeah, I don't know. All my time I just spend kind of thinking about NFTs or <laughs> like my free time is really just like researching <laughs> NFTs and NFT projects and like kind of deep diving into it. So even the podcasts I'm listening to, typically a NFT podcast. Um, I think because it's such a new thing to me relative to everything else, it's still very exciting. And I still feel like I'm at that early, early phase of anything could happen. And so I'm kind of like deep down into that, into the rabbit hole, you know? Right. Um, what else do I like doing? I like exercising. Yeah, I don't really like going on runs, but I still do it. <laughs> um, I love going on walks though. Yeah. And as somebody who's successful, right, you should always give back and try to bring other people up with you. So what have you done or what do you plan to do to try to help other people who may want to be in the same position as you? Yeah, um, well, for one, like I encourage anyone always like reach out to me on Instagram. I love answering questions, sending voice notes back and forth, whatever. Um, tomorrow I'm actually going to UE to speak to a design class. Uh, I'm also organizing with the art teacher at CIC, which is the school I went to to come in and speak to his form threes and the form sixes. So I definitely try to give as much of my time as possible, which is always a bit challenging. Um, but I know that like when I was in CIC, an artist who were making a career for themselves would come in to talk to us. That would make such a huge difference and it would kind of make it a reality. So I try to, as best as possible, kind of also do that. And I mean, for whoever, for whoever you know, like, I remember one time I went to speak to a class once, it was like a Form 3 class, and I just talked to the whole thing, I had to buff people and thing, and I was like, <laughs> but it, there's probably like three fellas in there in that class who were like, wow, this is actually real cool, even though it was like maybe like a little bit of a, I don't know if it was the time of day, like right after lunchtime or something, it was a little bit of a misbehaved class, but I was like, there might be like three people in here that really took what I said to heart, and yeah. that's worth it, you know, yeah, so. It would always have that one person or however much. For sure, for sure. So, yeah, I mean, I try to, like, literally just give as much time as possible to, to anyone, you know, within reason, I guess. <laughs> nice. I mean, my rapid question's really finished, but I had a bit of a kicksy personal question here. Okay. Um, I see you, Mari, so congrats on that. Thank you. I kind of want um, some advice on how to find you one. <laughs> um, Tough out there. I don't know, boy. I, so I met my wife at, so one of my best friends, he's like, hey boy, I have a family reunion, I have a real family coming in from abroad. He's like, you mind helping me entertain? And yeah, I still hear out here entertaining, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so I ended up, yeah, I ended up um, marrying like my best, one of my best friends, his cousin, which is nice. So I don't know what to tell you, maybe attend some friends' family reunions, you might, you might, get, you might get, get some luck there, I don't know. Uh, okay, and uh, that's probably the last one, but if I had to ask one of your friends, you know, to describe you, what would they say? Um, I don't know. Friends, boy? What would they say? 
I try not. I try not think of like was he was he was he PC answer to that, you know? Because you know you know you know fellas just be. Um, I think they probably say hardworking, and I don't know. I I like to think that I'm a funny person, but they may they may think otherwise. Close off there. It's one fifty. I'm just aiming for Jesus Christ. I, I like the lo- I like the long form though. Yeah, I know, but some people were telling us, you know, ADHD and thing. They don't take a sit down for two hours and watch a. I mean, that's, that's why we have the clips too, eh? So yeah, I know that's, that's why I think too. It would be real um, good for y'all to put on Spotify and Apple Music because most people won't sit down and watch YouTube for two hours, but they will put on a podcast while they're working yeah. for two hours. Drag, like. you know, yeah, yeah I wanna. Because like so I do some research. Yeah, do and like as I said, I consume a real podcast, and it's mostly when I'm driving. Even coming here as a listen to a podcast. Me too. When I know? drive, it, it's yeah, if it's on Apple Gregor, Podcast. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So yeah, if y'all could figure that one out, I think you'll. It, I remember it's probably not hard. Eh? It probably yeah, really not hard. No, I think there's one website you upload it to, and then it puts it out. Oh, to everything. Yeah, yeah. Right, have one of those. You just pull the audio and just upload it. I think. And then we do the edit though. But well, I still have to edit. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Nicholas, I just like to say thank you for coming around and talking to us. We really appreciate it. Yeah, um, it was so nice to talk to you and hear from you. You know. We, although we may not be in your space, we look up to you. I find you've been doing really good for how young you are. And I appreciate that. How young your business is. Guys, follow Nicholas on Instagram at Nicholas Huggins De- Creative. Yeah. Follow Backyard Designs. You can check his Instagram bio and look through the links. You can see his portfolio. You can go on to his LinkedIn. You can go on to his company profile. Um, if you have a business or your daddy have a business and you need a logo or you need to rebrand, hit him up. He'll do you justice. But Nicholas, thanks again. Really, really appreciate yeah, it. Definitely. Really appreciate thanks for coming through. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks for coming. Yeah.